Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we just want to give a quick welcome to our speakers who have joined us, uh, some from very near and some from far, as far as Salt Lake City. Um, we're, uh, we're lucky to have with us uh, Yara Bayume as our moderator this afternoon. Um, uh, Dr. Bahman Bakhtiari, Senior Consultant uh, with Omid for Iran. Uh, Suzanne Maloney, Deputy Director of Foreign Policy at Brookings Institution. Um, and uh, Mehdi Khalaji, Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute. And our colleague Ali Alfune, who is a Senior Fellow here at AGSIW. Uh, just wanted to bring your attention, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, Ali's paper that was just released on political succession in Iran and the role of the Revolutionary Guard. Um, I will hold it up. Some of you may have gotten a copy, but please feel free to grab one on your way out. Uh, if you don't know, Ali is working on a book uh, on the subject, and we're lucky to have him with us here at AGSIW as he does that. I won't go into detail of everyone's bio, but you have a copy of it on, uh, on your chair, so please feel free to refer to that. Um, just a last uh, notice, uh, we are being live streamed uh, and recorded today, so please silence your phones before we get started. And with that, uh, Yara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Here we go. Very happy to be here with you all today, and we have a pretty distinguished, um, very distinguished panel with us. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. I'm hoping that we'll have a lively conversation here, and then we'll open it up to questions um, at the end. So with that, um, I'm going to start with you, Bahman. Uh, we're 40 years uh, since, the, since the revolution now. The big question, or one of the biggest questions that, we're, that is on a lot of people's minds are, are the conditions now present uh, for another revolution right now? Well, thank you very much, Yara. Uh, I'd like to thank Ambassador Wahba for uh, arranging this talk and also thank Raymond and the program group to, who have arranged it. Uh, very interesting panel. And uh, as everybody knows, uh, discussions about Iran is a continuing issue. Mm -hmm. So I will do my best to answer that question. It's the million dollar question, but yeah. I will do my best to answer that question. Now, as you know, I've worked a lot on Iranian politics, and uh, in some of my works, I introduced the concept of factionocracy in Iran. And to me, Iran is not an Islamic Republic, it's a factionocracy. And that factionocracy that started with the revolution of 57 uh, has evolved and gone through phases for the past 40 years that has become more uh, entrenched, become more difficult to dislodge. And in many ways, uh, uh, the role of the leaders have also become kind of uh, diluted. So in the past 40 years now, if we keep thinking about Iran today, I think most of us on this table agree that Iran is in a major crisis today. And is facing a crisis that has never felt for the past 40 years. And that crisis, uh, uh, goes around the leaderships, institutions, economic uh, centers of power, IRGCs and all that. And that crisis has reached a tipping point. And uh, what I think is going to happen in Iran is not a revolution like 1957, uh, 1979. Um, first, our concept of revolution has to be defined. If you think of a revolution as a special event, at something that happened, then that's not going to happen. If you think of a revolution as a process that took at least 30 years to get to the point that it was, maybe, I would say, the process in Iran has started. And the second part of this question is that we have had several types of revolutions in Iran already in the past 40 years. We have had a revolution among the young who have now completely become expert in every tech, communication, social media. They speak English. They're very comfortable with expressing their viewpoints on the media, social media and going after anybody. We have had a revolution among Iranian women who have opposed the Islamization of the regime. And most importantly, I think we had a revolution within the clerical system in Iran 
I think maybe can speak more authoritative to that. And the revolution within the clerical system of Iran has moved toward a path that they think political clerics like Khamenei and others have corrupted religion. And religion has been corrupted by politics, and their politics is so corrupt in terms of the economic activities that people in Iran are, cannot see this regime, Islamic Republic, to remain Islamic. So I always tell my friends that in Iran, the most important narrative is that majority of Iranians do desire regime change inside Iran. And it is a, is a concept that what do they mean by that regime change? And in Iran, if you ride in a taxi, if you go to the parliament, if you go to the university, the discussion is all criticizing the regime. That why this regime is weak in governance, mismanagement. So, so that regime change concept narrative is very apparent in Iran. I think the factor that has entered into the succession issue that you raise and revolution issue is a corruption factor. Mm -hmm. Corruption inside Iran is so pervasive today. It has reached every institution of the government. Mm -hmm. It has reached individuals, powerful individuals. So when and you talk, sorry, so when you talk about this idea of a tipping point mm -hmm. then, I mean, what does that, what does that look like? I mean, is it yeah. through the pervasive corruption that you think people will overwhelmingly then respond to? No, I, I, I think, um, I think the tipping point I'm referring to is a tipping point that the state itself will not be able to maintain mm -hmm. such a factionocracy mm -hmm. because of the divergent economic interests and the corruption that is going on. And I think uh, a post Khamenei system in Iran, in the best case scenario, in the best case scenario is to find somebody who could transition the effects of Khamenei not being uh, kind of reduced, maintain the status quo. But the worst case scenario, I think, is an implosion. It's an implosion in a way that we witnessed in Eastern <coughs> Europe. When Soviet Union fell apart, uh, many of those countries did not go through this revolution. They went through an implosion. Uh, it's an implosion that uh, the political structures inside the country is not ready to handle. Is a is a kind of a a strategy inside the ruling regime in Iran that number one is survival. That's all they think about. Popular dissatisfaction is on the rise. And I think that dissatisfaction has reached the middle class in 2009, the urban population. Today has reached the poor and the supporters of the regime. Last year, all those demonstrations you saw, they were part of the passages. They were conservative religious people. That's why they came on the streets. They could say things that others could not. So I, I think in the best case scenario for them is transitioning from a difficult situation they have to a post hominy system. And I doubt very much they're going to keep uh, or find somebody as symbolically in terms of hominy. They, they haven't decided yet. So they have options for them. Mm -hmm. But I, I, just, I just don't see this system so corrupt, so factionalized, so divided. And so at war, in a way, right. with the West and everything, to, to be able to go. But th there will not be a revolution, I think. Uh, I'm, t I'm willing to take a chance here and say the worst case scenario is an implosion. Mahdi, let me turn it to you. What, do you. what do you think about that? Do you see that as possible? And just to kind of, and to take it then further, if we get to this question, to, get, to take it to this question of succession as well. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think Islamic Republic can be described as a, uh, what political scientists call uh, electoral authoritarianism or uh, semi-totalitarianism, um, which is a kind of hybrid regime. Uh, they have, uh, <clears throat> the hardcore of the regime is authoritarian, but they have um, a system for election and competition between different factions. Um, as my friend Mr. Bakhtiari said. Um, so um, they are uh, well um, uh, capable of uh, controlling uh, any kind of conflict on the top and also dissatisfaction on the bottom. So that's why you see that in, for example, especially last year, 
there have been some um, uh, demonstrations here and there, um, or um, small you know, uprisings, uh, in, even in the small cities. But uh, the government is um, capable of controlling all of them. And I don't see Islamic Republic being concerned much about uh, the um, widespread uh, dissatisfaction which exists among ordinary people as well as elite, and uh, you know, including clerics, as uh, my friend said. So um, when it comes to the question of succession, we know that there is no established pattern for succession in, in Islamic Republic. Ayatollah Khomeini became the supreme leader of Islamic Republic out of a revolution. Everyone accepted him and recognized him as the leader, even those uh, uh, leftist uh, organizations who did not believe in the, even in, in, in religion or the leadership of uh, uh, religious people. But all of them uh, accepted Ayatollah Khomeini as the leader of Islamic Republic or as the leader of the revolution itself. When Ayatollah Khomeini died, the government was um, controlled by a handful of people. So it was very easy for these people to sit uh, and uh, decide uh, who's going to be this next supreme leader. So we had Rafsanjani, we had uh, Khamenei, uh, Musavi Ardabili, and others. So um, it was not difficult to decide about the succession of Khomeini and uh, legalize this decision by the um, uh, Assembly of Experts. We know now very well that Assembly of Experts did not have that much role in appointing Khamenei as the supreme leader. Now the situation is different. We, do, we, we don't face uh, individuals, powerful individuals. We face powerful uh, organizations and institutions. We have a revolutionary guard. We have a judiciary. We have um, intelligence apparatus of the country. So uh, the question is that uh, these organizations, how they co coordinate with each other, how they come to some sort of concession about the succession of Khamenei. First of all, as long as Khamenei is alive, I don't think that there would be any indication from him or the government about who's going to be the next supreme leader. That's very dangerous. Once they did this in, uh, during Khomeini, they appointed Ayatollah Montazeri as the successor, but it turned bad because the, the guy became a center of power for himself, and he started to challenge the authority of the existing supreme leader. So this time, uh, they don't want to create a more problem by appointing or indicating uh, that this person or that, per that person is the successor. I think there are several possible scenarios for the succession, but I, I do think that this time um, the succession would go through a more sophisticated uh, process. Um, uh, in 1989, it took them only half a day to appoint a supreme uh, leader, a new supreme leader, just half a day. Uh, Khomeini was not married yet, um, and they decided about his successor, succession. This time, I think it's not going to be like that um, uh, because uh, there is lots of conflict of interest between different institutions and even within each institution there are different factions who are competing over uh, various issues, economic, cultural, and there is a different level of the loyalty to the Islamic ideology. So for example, even the, uh, within revolutionary regard, you find some uh, commanders who uh, prefer the country to open up to the West and do business like you know, Russia and so on. Uh, some of them, they prefer to stick to the uh, ideology of Islamic Republic. So it's not monolithic. So I think this time it is going through a more slow, sophisticated process. But um, immediately after the death of Khamenei, they, according to the Constitution, they can form a, a council, council, the provisional council of leadership. In the provisional council of leadership, uh, there will be president, 
There will be the head, uh, the chief of judiciary, and a person who will be uh, uh, appointed or elected by the guardian council. Uh, the problem is that in the constitution, it doesn't say how long this council can work. So there is no time limit for it. But at the same time, we know that there is a time limit for president. President sure. is a president only for four years, or the judiciary chief for five years. Um, and I think the many powerful institutions and individuals in Iran prefer to see um, a weak uh, supreme leader uh, uh, replacing Khamenei uh, to maintain the legitimacy of Islamic Republic and uh, actually hold this position in a more ceremonial way and actually run the country through organizations, through Revolutionary Guard. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. That was there is a lot here to consider, including especially this idea of the institutions versus uh, the individuals. So I'm just going to go to Ali right now. I mean, you in a in your paper argue that this is a theocracy that is evolving into a military dictatorship, and specifically are looking at sort of the rising role of the IRGC there. I mean, so do you, do you, do you see them then in this, within the context of this issue of succession then having a much bigger say than they did before? So thank you very much for your question and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is exactly true. Uh, Iran used to be a country uh, where we had uh, a division of labor between two very, very strong institutions, two pillars of the system. One of those pillars was that of the technocratic elites of Iran and the clerics. They were the rulers of the Islamic Republic. And the other pillar of the system was that of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, which protects the regime against domestic and external enemies. So in other words, the difference between the United States military and the Revolutionary Guards is that the US military does not intervene in the domestic politics of the US. In the Iranian context, the Revolutionary Guards is constitutionally mandated to protect the regime. The exact text, text is the Revolutionary Guards is mandated to protect and safeguard the revolution and its achievements. So in other words, the army, the regular military, has to secure the territorial integrity of Iran. The Revolutionary Guards is protecting the ideological nature of the regime. So their interferences in the domestic politics is not illegal. It is constitutionally mandated. And that is some of the discussions that I have with some, of, some, some Iranian friends who keep telling me that IRGC is violating the law. What I'm telling them is that the Revolutionary Guards is actually d doing exactly what it is asked to do according to the Constitution. Now, gradually, we are seeing a change in, in that system uh, where one of those pillars is becoming weaker than the other. And the reason is, first and foremost, external pressure. Iran has been in more or less a constant state of crisis ever since the revolution. Sometimes that crisis is more severe than others. There is domestic issues, as mentioned by all panelists, and a pressure against the regime. So Mr. Khamenei has tried systematically to empower the revolutionary guards in order to protect the regime against domestic threats and external threats. In other words, the pillar of the Revolutionary Guards has become so much more stronger than the other pillar of the technocrats and the clerics. This puts the Revolutionary Guards in a unique position to impact the process of political succession in a much more profound and stronger way than the case was back in 1989. As my good friend Mr. Khaleji correctly mentioned, back in 1989, the Revolutionary Guards hardly played any role in, in succession, and this the, the seizure of power by, by, by Mr. Khamenei. It was a very, very small group of individuals, most of them clerics, though the technocratic and clerical elites of the regime who managed the succession process, particularly Mr. Rafsanjani, who used his entire network in order to bring about change to make Mr. Khamenei the leader and retroactively change the constitution to legitimize Khamenei's seizure of power. This time around, 
Mr. Rafsanjani is no longer among us. His network is weak. Who is replacing Mr. Rafsanjani? An institution. The institution of the Revolutionary Guards. Now, there are several risks involved because it's not going to be an easy process for anyone, not even for the Revolutionary Guard to elect their man into power as the next leader of Iran. The big issue is that there are still some small pockets of civilian resistance to transformation of Iran into a military dictatorship. One of those pockets of resistance is the people who are ideologically representing the heritage of Mr. Rafsanjani. That is Mr. Rouhani. Rouhani inherited not only Rafsanjani's way of thinking, but also his network. And he also constitutes one of the few pockets of civilian resistance to transformation of Iran into a military dictatorship. So right now, the Revolutionary Guards is systematically trying to weaken and marginalize the president of the republic. Mr. Dr. Bakhtir was exactly right when he mentioned that back in 2017, December of 17 and January of 18, many of the public protests, uh, these people were hungry, they went to the street, and the Revolutionary Guards helped them, helped them communicate their message through the so-called right-wing media in Iran. Kehan newspaper was all the time reporting the hungry people protesting. Other Revolutionary Guards uh, uh, the news sources, for example, in the Fars News Agency, they were reflecting all the demonstrations because initially they were against President Rouhani. But of course, things got out of control. The same people who were to the, went to the streets of Mashhad to chant against President Rouhani and complain about the miserable state of affairs and all their economic grievances, the fact that they cannot even buy meat once a month, not even once a month can they afford to buy meat, the same people began chanting slogans against Supreme Leader Khamenei against the Revolutionary Guards, and against the Revolutionary Guards using Iranian taxpayer money in Syria. The situation got out of control. So the process, even for a formidable organization like that of the Revolutionary Guards, is very risky. Because you want to weaken the last pockets of civilian resistance to your rule. But when you try to mobilize the public, the public is angry and is expressing anger against the regime in its entirety. Could you maybe, just to follow up on that then, how do you see the, IR how has the IRGC been then responding to the latest protests that we've, that we've seen right now? And also have you seen the IRGC, as, as Mahdi had earlier said, that this idea of the competing institutions, so we, you've outlined very clearly how they've done that again with the public, but how have they also then manipulated sort of other um, factions of power as well. When it comes to their ability to control the crisis, I think that the Revolutionary Guards learned many, many important lessons from the unrest in 2009. In 2009, the Revolutionary Guards and the Basij militia, they constituted the first line of defense against the protesters in 2009. That was not the case in 17. In 2000 and by 2017, December, they had managed to reform and reorganize the police force. So if you look at the structure and composition of the law enforcement forces, the Iranian police, you see that all the provincial police chiefs are former officers of the Revolutionary Guards. So at the very top level in the provinces, it is an IRGC officer who has become a police chief. Next level, you have professional police officers, and nowadays you see the, the police force constituting the first line of defense of the regime against protests. The other thing which is very important is that they managed through professional police force intervention against the protesters to bring down the number of people who were killed. Because even in a country like Iran, where human life unfortunately has so little value, it actually makes a difference if you arrest people or if you kill people. In 2009, people were killed. In 17, very, very few people were killed, five or six in one of the provinces. Most other places, the professional police force, force managed to contain the crisis. Mm -hmm. 
Simultaneously, they are not, you know, the Revolution Guards are not just dealing with the protesters, they are also dealing with other elite right. members. So what do they do? They systematically infiltrate the formal institutions of power. So if you look at the composition of the Iranian parliament, you see many, many veterans of the Revolutionary Guards. Mm -hmm. Not Mr. Rouhani's cabinet, but the cabinet of President Ahmadinejad, 70% of the cabinet ministers were Revolutionary Guards officers. So what they do is they try to elect their own people into public offices, into formal institutions of power, and they also use their economic leverage in order to a, in, in escape, uh, manage, manage some kind of relationship with the what remains of, of the Iranian private sector. So Iranians depend economically also on the revolutionary guard. So, so they are sophisticated, but I, I, I also must say, and, and this is going to be the last words I say in, in this round, I think the clerics are much more, much more sophisticated in the long term when it comes to ruling of Iran. So transformation of the Islamic Republic into a military dictatorship actually doesn't promise so, so, so well for the overall survivability of the regime. On that note, we'll get to that um, as well. But I wanted to take it a little bit closer to where, where we are today and talk to you, Suzanne, uh, just about where you see U.S. policy right now towards Iran. I mean, it's always, as we see, the number one, ostensibly the number one uh, foreign policy focus of this administration. Uh, we heard from President Trump um, at the State of the Union address a very brief uh, comment on Iran that really didn't sort of give any major indication in terms of policy beyond a broad talking point there. And we've seen, obviously, a lot of sanctions um, that have been systematically uh, kind of introduced and reintroduced. But where do you see the long-term policy goals of this administration towards Iran? And does this succession debate really play um, a role into it as well? Thank you, Yara, and thank you um, to Ambassador Wafa and Raymond for inviting me to be part of this terrific panel. Um, I'm really glad to be here. It, it's been a, you know, a tumultuous couple of years since the election of Donald Trump to the presidency, um, which of course cast the, the kind of paradigm that had been set by the Obama administration for an approach to Iran, an opening to Iran, which began with the, the nuclear negotiations, and I think at least from the perspective of that administration, was intended to move beyond the nuclear issue and address regional issues and potentially other issues of difference between the two parties. Um, the, the Trump election um, disrupted that entirely, and obviously last May, the president made good on the promise that he had made on the campaign trail, um, and it, it's interesting because he walked away from the deal, but his promise on the campaign trail, and at the time it really differentiated him from some of his rivals in the Republican primaries, um, was to renegotiate, um, not simply to walk away from the deal. And so that, I think, remains his objective. He occasionally, particularly when it's extemporaneous comments, uh, as opposed to a planned speech like the State of the Union, um, you hear him speak to the fact that he expects Iran to come back to the no negotiating table. He knows they'll come back. He's ready to make a good deal. Um, that appears to be at least where the president is. Um, and that that, in fact, may parallel the way that he has approached the North Korea issue, where he applied what was described as maximum pressure and uh, then was very satisfied with at least the trappings of a diplomatic process that uh, from, it, from those who focus on the issue, uh, are, there is at least some lack of conviction Absolutely. that it, in fact, addresses the root of the, the, the nuclear crisis there. Um, and so there is some... I think reason to believe that that's uh, that there's a parallel track that would satisfy the president himself um, quite happily with respect to Iran. I don't think that's where his senior national security advisors are, particularly the national security advisor John Bolton, who's been on record um, for many years as a supporter of regime change in Iran, um, who has a longstanding previous affiliation or uh, has uh, engaged frequently with the Mojahedin al Khalq uh, prior to coming into his current position. Uh, the Mojahedin al Khalq, as I'm sure you all know, is a discredited exile cult group um, 
that uh, has been, tried to assert itself as a credible opposition for Iran. Um, Secretary Pompeo, sec the Secretary of State, has also seemed to make Iran his signal issue. He's actually, I think, you know, in a sort of bureaucratically savvy way, um, by creating the position of an envoy for Iran, managed to keep this uh, very much a State Department directed policy. He's given a number of major speeches on the issue. I, it, it appears to me that both P Bolton and Pompeo and the gist of U.S. policy is at this stage the application of as much pressure as possible. That's consistent with what the President may want in terms of a negotiation. Um, I suspect the terms of that negotiation, based on what Pompeo has said in public, based on what uh, John Bolton also in his public remarks and in his long career on this issue, um, would have a much higher bar for any kind of an agreement with Iran. Um, and, and in a sense, they're quite happy right now. Um, there's a consensus on pressure because it serves both their purposes. Um, my expectation is that at some stage, this will become, the, the, the tensions between the objectives will become a little bit more evident. Um, and it's in part because I share the assessment, I think, of all the other panelists that Iran is in a very difficult predicament right now. Um, these sanctions uh, have only compounded what was a, a um, really problematic economic situation um, and would have been, I think, uh, difficult for the Iranian leadership to navigate irrespective of U.S. policy. But the sanctions have made it, uh, you know, exponentially more difficult given the retreat of almost all major investors and the difficulties that Iran now has in doing even ordinary, even illicit trade, non-sanctioned trade in humanitarian goods and agricultural products um, today. And that economic pressure doesn't really have a neat resolution except through some sort of conceivable diplomatic overture. Yeah. Um, there's really no way to get out from under. You can manage sanctions, you can mitigate, you can try to evade, but fundamentally, if what you want is a much more uh, robust economy for the purposes of regime survival or for the purposes of elite enrichment or for all those purposes, the only pathway toward that at the moment would appear to be through some kind of dialogue with the United States. And so I think at some stage, we're, it, as, as unlikely as it is, as embittered as Iranian authorities and, and Iranian people in many cases are toward the United States over the decision to withdraw from the deal, I think it's not inconceivable that we're going to see some kind of testing of the waters of what kind of, uh, what kind of a negotiation might be possible. And ju just on that, I mean, do you see, I mean, I, just to bring it back to also this issue of, of the regime change versus also the succession dynamic there, I mean, do, do you see that this is what U.S. policy is kind of, you know, inching towards or trying to precipitate in some way, even if it's not regime change, but to provoke um, to provoke these factors that could lead to a big, a big, you know, a big debate on succession, resulting in that, is that kind, of, is that where you see the U.S. policy kind of gearing towards at all? I think the, you know, the almost coincidental eruption of protests last December mm -hmm. and into January of 2018 um, gave great new, new impetus around this strategy, this expectation that pressure could in fact produce some kind of short-term upheaval. Um, and frankly, f you know, if you don't watch Iran closely, as I'm sure if you're national security advisor, you know, you have other things to think about every day. Um, it, you know, it's tempting to look at what happened and say this is, this is you know, an imminent revolution. Um, in the long span of 40 years, Iran has experienced a lot of turmoil over that time, whether it's economically driven, politically driven, socially driven, in some cases ethnically and over ethnic and religious differences. Um, as I said, I tend to agree that Iran is in a, is in a really tough spot. These protests are, are in some ways qualitatively different, in part because of the proliferation of technology. Um, what we don't yet see is, or what I wouldn't have confidence in, is a kind of short-term transition. But if you're sitting in the White House um, and you're seeing, you know, these really telegenic moments, it's all being shared on Twitter, and um, I think there is an expectation that, that economic pressure will, will drive the factionalism um, to be much more cutthroat. Um, and create real pressures among what has always been a regime of, of considerable ideological and, and differences among power centers, um, and will put pressure from below as well. So you have these multiple sources of, of difficulties uh, to hold the system together. Uh, you know, I'm, 
I, I don't feel confident in saying that either Pompeo or Bolton or anyone in the U.S. government is sort of holding their breath for regime right. change in the short term. But I think they're quite happy to see Iran under severe constraint. And if regime change is a happy byproduct of that, mm -hmm. then wonderful. Well, thank you for all of those. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions here, um, and then, and please feel free to 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 jump in as well, um, as we, you know, as as we kind of continue with uh, with sort of where we're where we're, where we're going here. Um, I thought it was really interesting uh, to hear um, that we we are sort of now at this point where we are seeing um, conditions in Iran that. We haven't, you know, we haven't seen before. We may have seen some sort of permutations of it, but what we are, like, we are right now at a very um, unique moment, and the Trump presidency factor is a big part, is a big part of that as well. How do you, I'm curious to hear from you, of how do you then see, given that we've now talked about the competing fac factions there as well, is there, is there also a difference between those competing factions in how to deal with this Trump administration. Um, I will open it. Mahdi, do you want to take a tap at that, and then we'll, we'll go to our other panelists? Um, I think the general um, understanding is in Tehran on um, both factions of Islamic Republic is that it's extremely difficult to negotiate with uh, President Trump. And um, the fact that um, Trump has withdrawn from the JCPOA uh, made them believe that uh, the problem uh, of Trump with Islamic Republic is greater than the nuclear program. Mm -hmm. So it's about Iran's uh, involvement in the region and uh, various policies Iran holds in, uh, in the Middle East. And don't forget that the, when it comes to the nuclear program, there is two different opinions within Islamic Republic. Uh, one uh, held by radicals, and another one uh, uh, held by uh, moderates. Moderates like Rouhani believe that we don't need to uh, rush too much. Let's uh, you know, work with the West and um, go uh, slowly. But when it comes to the regional policy of Islamic Republic, uh, it seems to me that uh, there is a consensus between two factions in Islamic Republic. I mean, I, uh, Rouhani, as is uh, supporting Iran's, uh, despite the fact that he doesn't have that much role, as much mm -hmm. as at least Khamenei has, or Revolutionary Guard has, in, in uh, designing and implementing the regional policy of Islamic Republic, but basically he supports this policy. I mean, the, the Iran's support to Hezbollah or Iran's support to Assad regime is one of the pillars of Islamic uh, Republic's foreign policy uh, in uh, the eyes of both factions. So I don't think that there would be that much disagreement in this part. That makes them, both of them, less enthusiastic about negotiating with United States because if they sit on the negotiation table, I think with President Trump, it's not only about the nuclear program. It's about many other issues that are considered to be uh, both uh, factions red line. And uh, I think they are looking forward to the next president of United States. I don't know whether they can tolerate this uh, economic hardship or not, but at least it seems that um, Ayatollah Khamenei is confident that yes, it's difficult, it's, it's uh, extremely hard for people, it, it's extremely hard for the government to justify this, this the current situation, uh, but um, so what? If we negotiate with West, we uh, put the existence of Islamic Republic at risk. Uh, especially with uh, uh, Mr. Trump, because they believe that Trump's problem is not this or that policy. Trump's problem is Islamic Republic. Okay. Dr. Bakhtiari, do you want to add to that? Well, I think one thing is important to note, uh, one thing is important to keep in mind is that uh, the rulers of the Islamic Republic today, like Mr. Khamenei, they approach relations with the United States in a much more historical, personal terms. Khamenei became president of Iran in 1981. Mm -hmm. And Khamenei, before the revolution, was part of a cell that organized uprisings inside Iran. 
Later, he was involved with uh, post-revolution contacts with Jimmy Carter. Altogether, Khamenei has dealt with seven U.S. administrations, Democrat, Republican, seven. And from that perspective, uh, he also, as president in 1987, came to New York to deliver a U.N. talk. And just before his speech started, Revolutionary Guards placed mines in the Persian Gulf and blew up American ships to make sure that that trip does not lead to any negotiation. So he got a signal there on his first international trip in 1987. When he got back to Iran, he had to deal with the end of the war, with Iraq, with the factions. I don't think he wanted to be supreme leader, Khamenei. So he was a reluctant supreme leader, then was taken over by the system, and now we have this powerful centralized government that we have. So Khamenei's experience when it comes to the United States, he takes this long-term perspective from Jimmy Carter to Trump. Mm -hmm. And if you take a long-term perspective from his view, there has been many up and downs in this relationship, from secret arms sales in 1984 to 86. And by the way, Rouhani was also part of that arms sales mm -hmm. during that time, remember? He was, I think he met with Bob McFarlane. <laughs> so these people come to the United States with that experience in mind. And that experience tells them one thing, procrastinate, wait long term, portray organized chaos situation, and portray the situation that whatever is signed, when it goes to Tehran, it will not be kept. Right. I don't think any US administration, even Trump or not, can come to those terms because I think unless this uh, Khamenei and his supporters get their act together and address some serious issues like the issue of in, in Syria, in Yemen, or issue of Israel, the most important, unless they get to address those issues among themselves first and come to the table later, I really don't see any negotiations. Right now, Iranian wrestlers would not wrestle in international competition against Israeli wrestlers. Sure. That's, that's how deep we are, that even in the most sport-like conduct, they force the wrestler to step out and not wrestle. So coming to all these issues that has been going on for 40 years with the Islamic Republic, I think sometimes these people in Tehran see it that not having a relationship is not a bad idea. <laughs> and what do we get in having a relationship? That's, I think, uh, that's, that's my perspective on that, yes. Avi, I want to hear from you um, on that, but also just to add to that, what, what I've been hearing so far is sort of from, from, from Tehran's side, that's this idea of um, waiting out this administration, taking the long view. But if we try and put that also together with this idea that the economic hardship is becoming more and more intolerable, so where is the tension here? At what point do we begin to see that playing out in a different way? Uh, I have a slightly different take on, on, mm -hmm. on, on the issue because I do not see uh, reluctance from Tehran's side to engage in negotiations even with the Trump administration. I think the big problem is who should represent the Islamic Republic of Iran in negotiations with the United States. So what we see right now is repetition of the sabotage policies of the 1980s. Whenever one institution, one power center, engages in direct talks with the United States, the rivaling faction will try to sabotage those talks. Let me give you a couple of examples. President Rouhani made a public speech uh, in which he specifically said on, on, on live television that we engage in negotiations with all US administration. My foreign minister, Dr. Zarif, engaged in talks with Secretary of State Tillerson on the sides of the UN General Assembly. Mm -hmm. He said that. Specifically was signaling that his administration was ready to engage in talks with the US. A couple of days later, a very unlikely individual, my good friend Major General Ghassem Soleimani, the chief commander of the Quds Force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, made a speech in which he called President Trump a gambler, and you know everybody interpreted the speech as if it was a frontal like, attack against the US president. But he also said something else. He said, when US commanders in Iraq were in need of our help, 
when they were interested in bringing down the number of U.S. casualties in Iraq, they began sending me text messages. I responded those text messages, and I would be happy to send more text messages. So in other words, the problem is not a philosophical opposition to talking with the US. The big issue is who should engage in those talks. And that, of course, also goes back to the, the issue of a political succession in Iran. After all, the biggest crisis in the history of Iran and the United States was that of the hostage taking of American diplomats in Iran. Why did that happen? because there was an issue of who should rule Iran. There were a group of people who were very, very afraid of the transitional government of Prime Minister Bazargan. What did they do? They did the easiest thing imaginable. They took the American diplomats hostage, after which the Bazargan government resigned. Power changed hands from the hands of the moderates to the hands of the radicals. There was not a philosophical issue if the revolutionary regime should engage in talks with the US or not. The big issue was who is going to represent Iran. And on the issue of regional policies, I completely agree. I do not see any big differences between the philosophical foundations of the thinking, strategic thinking of President Rouhani and the commanders of the revolutionary guards. Mr. Rouhani was for years and years the longest serving secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, which makes all the strategic decisions in the Islamic Republic. His mentality and thinking is not different when it comes to regional issues, or for that matter, when it comes to the nuclear issue. However, because of the succession issue, and because of the fact that President Rouhani, after all, is a politician, he may suddenly change. After all, why should he not suddenly flip and say, oh, by the way, I was always against Iran using its money, blood, and treasure in Syria. It was the Revolutionary Guards doing this. Because he knows that it would be a popular and populist agenda. He's a politician. Don't underestimate it. Thank you, Ali. Suzanne, I just want to come to you then, picking up on that note. Do you see that the Europeans who are now engaging or trying to maintain uh, some sort of active involvement with the Iranians as well, willing to, you know, willing to engage on this issue of trying to create a circumstance in which you know, President Rouhani or other, or other factions can be persuaded to deal with the other elements here besides the nuclear issue to in some way show the US as well we can get traction here? That's a really good question, and I don't think I have a definitive, uh, clear answer. Um, I think, you know, to date, the Europeans have been focused on trying to shore up support within Iran for sustaining their uh, adherence to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, and the primary thing that they needed to do, besides just verbal reassurance, was to create this banking channel, which was just actually uh, established last week. Yeah. It will only deal in non-sanctioned goods, so food, medicine, pharmaceutical products, agricultural products. Uh, the Iranians are fairly disappointed with this, but I think that disappointment, in a sense, was already made clear because it's taken them this long to yes. even get this far, and there have been so many problems along the way. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure how much leverage anyone in Europe has right now to, to persuade Tehran. I'm not sure how much leverage they have here in Washington. And it's also not clear to me that, you know, as much as they're committed to trying to sustain the deal, because they were invested in the negotiations even before we were here in Washington, um, you know, they have other issues on their agenda in dealing with the Trump administration. Right. And Iran is important in its own right for a variety of reasons, but it doesn't in many respects outflank those other issues at stake over trade, over NATO security, and their own internal issues uh, for, the, for the British. So um, I don't really see the Europeans playing an effective role as, as mediators between a, a, a divided Tehran and, and a Trump administration that still is a little bit strategically adrift. Right. I mean, and on that, on that note as well, I mean, one of the conditions that we see, 
I think, especially more different now with these protests that are happening now as we come up to, to the 40th anniversary here is also, I think, the Gulf-Israel dynamic, which was not a dynamic that I think uh, we had seen before. And I'm curious to hear from the panel how you think that dynamic sort of dictates as well um, Iran's continued, re you know, Iran's regional policies, does it continue on with its expansionism, given now what it sees um, in the in the close in the, in the close closing of minds between the Gulf and Israel as well? And does Israel's influence with this issue also become more of a factor to reckon with because it obviously has uh, more capital with this administration specifically over this issue as well? Uh, Bahman, do you want to take that one? Um. It's a difficult question to answer, but I think, um, again, I'd like to take you back to the beginning of the revolution, because for us to understand four years after, I think it's critical to understand what happened in 1979, uh, because we need to start our understanding from that point in order to understand how this system mm -hmm. uh, conceptualizes its regional role. If you recall, right after the revolution, there was a huge debate among those who wanted to export the revolution and those who said we should not export the revolution, we should use the power of the revolution to negotiate, in a way, meaning use the people power. Export the revolution was part of an ideological obsession with these revolutionaries in the beginning. And it, it went all the way to Bahrain in the beginning, I remember. Some called, mentioned the war with Iraq, could have not been happening because if those people in Tehran keep continuously attacking. That export of revolution in the beginning was not very clear how it is uh, part of the system. It was individuals more. But I think after Khomeini's death, it suddenly transformed into a regional policy for the system. And it transformed into a regional policy for the system after the war, because during the war, two countries supported Iran, Yemen and Syria. Those are the only two countries that supported Iran during the war. And eight years of that export revolution kind of a uh, adjusted the mentality inside Iran that they need to have a role. One in Yemen because of the Indian Ocean, one in Lebanon because of Israel. So the more Israel threatens them, they can always pull that card that we have something in Syria and Lebanon against you. So it went from uh, export of revolution to involvement in Syria and Lebanon and Yemen as a card against regional players. It has now been entrenched into a military involvement that nobody knows really in Tehran who runs it, what's going on. One thing is clear is that they are supporting the opposition groups in that country. And uh, they see that as a kind of a calling card for them now. They are so weakened inside Iran, they are so weakened inside Iran, that if they want to negotiate with any country, they cannot talk about popular support for their policy. I don't think majority of Iranians would believe this regime can negotiate you know, honestly right now. There's such a doubt, hopelessness inside Iran that if this regime negotiates with the United States, they're going to have this perception, oh, oh, they must have gotten something for the person of Khamenei, for the factions, what happened, not for the country. So it is going to be a complicated negotiation process. It's going to be a process that requires a long-term dialogue, mm -hmm. a process that requires dialogue with the Iranian people. U.S. Have a, must have a better understanding of the Iranian people, their desires, their goals. What do they want and they envision? Mm -hmm. And then how does that fit with the desires and goals of this regime to negotiate? So I think in the United States, we frequently don't pay attention to the societal factors when it comes to American foreign policy. We always pay attention to resolving a conflict and finishing and going. But I think today, Iranian population is by far pro-American, I've witnessed it myself with wrestling matches there. Every time American wrestling team went to Iran, they got a huge welcome, and the regime got scared and reduced the audience size. Do you think that so. people would be open to sort of a more, uh, a more conducive atmosphere in which Saudi Arabia also plays, you know, also yeah. plays an, a significant role? I think there? they will be open to a negotiation that does not give in easily to this regime. And kind of it is symmetrical in a way that does not deny the interests of the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. Meaning, the uh, United States has to come up with a formula that uh, that formula, I think, views Iranian people in the same way we viewed 
Russians during communism. Mm -hmm. And in this country, American public opinion viewed the fight against communism as freeing the captive citizens of Soviet Union. There was a kind of a synergy. Unfortunately, the hostage crisis has damaged the Iranian public opinion, but I, I think a critical aspect of this whole thing has to be the interest of the Iranian people. Right. And Iranian people today have pretty much made it clear that their interest and this regime is very separate. Matthew, you spoke a bit about how you don't see um, the, Ira you know, the Iranian leadership right now uh, wanting to negotiate so much with, with the Americans right now. Do you see that there is more of a willingness uh, to then, to, where do you see their focus is of now then? Do you see more of a willingness to, to work with the Gulf on something, or do you think that that's also completely off the table, given how the, the anti-Iranian rhetoric, especially from, you know, from the Gulf, from Israel, has kind of reached um, a, pretty, you know, a pretty high point? <clears throat> um, if you look at the Islamic Republic, as uh, Mr. Bakhtiari said, um, the export of revolution or uh, some sort of imperialist uh, mm -hmm. aspiration is, a, um, um, is an essential component of Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. It's true that in Iran, if you say that, let's talk with Americans, you become popular. But the fact is that as long as you go inside the government and assume a position within the establishment, uh, you try to actually keep distance from this kind of discourse. Um, for example, Rouhani said many things that made him popular during the campaign. But when he came to power, uh, he uh, didn't deliver any of those promises because he knew that he cannot fight with the hardcore of the regime. Um, even he promised people to uh, uh, end the house arrest of uh, Mr. Musavi and Karubi leaders of uh, Green Movement. But when he came to power, he uh, found out that it's not, it's not possible. You know, Khamenei doesn't want it. And he didn't fight over it. He didn't want to open another front uh, uh, fighting with conservatives or hardliners over this issue. So I don't think, where, if you see Islamic Republic is trying to approach Arab states in the region, uh, is trying to normalize its relationship with the United States, uh, and it sounds like Iran is trying to end its imperialist agenda in the region, this means end of Islamic Republic mm -hmm. and the beginning of the completely different region. Because so far, Iranian uh, regime did not decide between country and cause, as Kissinger said. And I think uh, 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 it's not easy for Islamic Republic to normalize its relation with Arab countries. And uh, it just, it find it uh, another, another excuse mm -hmm. to actually enhance it's a, a radical, defiant uh, agenda in the Middle East. So having said that, and we'll turn it to questions shortly, but I wanted to ask spe specifically as well about um, the Trump administration's decision to withdraw, to withdraw its troops from Syria. One of the biggest, you know, one of the, 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 the most obvious reactions that we heard pretty immediately was, you know, the U.S. is pulling these troops out of Syria, creating this vacuum. Iran is going to come in and, 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 ta and, take, and take over. I wonder if this is um, exactly the situation uh, that you see it there, given that Iran already had a pretty significant influence in Syria as well. Um, the, the troops were, the U.S. troops were there ostensibly to fight um, Islamic State as opposed to us then sort of detecting this shift in U.S. policy on there, there now to confront Iran as well. But at the same time, we do, I don't really see, Suzanne, after what you've said, where, uh, you know, to what end is this U.S. policy, uh, is the U.S. policy towards Iran kind of taking shape beyond the sanctions that we've, that we've also kind of spoken about? So ju just, it would be interesting to hear from the panel, you know, what is the reality here of the exit of those U.S. troops from Syria? What does it mean for the Iranian presence, uh, the Iranian presence or influence there as well? I'll 
open it up to whoever would like to take that one. Ali? If, if uh, you know, I can take the liberty of going back to Iran-Arab relations mm -hmm. uh, and Iran-Israel relations, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, during the U.S.-Iran negotiations, nuclear negotiations, I had a conversation with one of the uh, very close uh, advisors of, of President Rouhani, and uh, you, you all know who he is. Uh, I, I, I told him, Mr. Ambassador, you cannot expect to bypass Israel and Arabs and reach an understanding with the U.S. He said, oh, my friend Ali, we have already fooled those Arabs and Israelis. We, we, made, the, we made the agreement with, with the Obama administration. I told him, Mr. Ambassador, even if you manage to get a nuclear deal with the Americans, you cannot expect that nuclear deal to be long-lived. And he said, oh, you wait and see. You wait and see. You are too young, my friend. This is where we are now. So the next leaders of Iran, the, those people in charge of Iran's foreign and security policy, which means the Revolutionary Guards, they need to understand that they cannot, in spite of all the signals that Major General Soleimani is sending to Washington, they cannot expect to normalize relations with the US unless Iran plays a similar role in the Arab world and in Israel. I even told that gentleman, you know, not, not so long ago, that there should be an ambassador like him in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. There should be an ambassador like him, unofficial ambassador like him in Riyadh. Having public diplomacy, having conversations, which bring about mutual understanding between Iran and the Arab world, between Iran and Israel. But he said that, well, it's, it's more, more, more easier said than done. You know, that was his answer. The other issue of, of export of the revolution, what we, we tend to forget is that whenever, you know, is that of bureaucratic politics. Whenever there is a bureaucracy, there will also be a policy. If there is an institution charged with exporting the revolution, that institution needs to get budget, personnel, so it will end up exporting the revolution. So this is also why that they have so much difficulties changing the fundamental lines in the policy of the Islamic Republic. But if the Revolutionary Guards truly wants to achieve an understanding with the US, and if removal of the sanctions regime, US-led sanctions, is the policy objective of the Revolutionary Guards. And if the Revolutionary Guards believes that he who manages to get rid of the US sanctions also will have a very, very big say on who will succeed Mr. Khamenei as the next leader of Iran, it is now that they need to take action. Thank you, Ali. Suzanne, do you want to take the Syria withdrawal question? Sure, I mean, I'll try. Um, I think, you know, the Trump administration and the president personally wants to fulfill his campaign promises, and he has a pretty astute sense of the American political mood, and that mood is not supportive of uh, another extended foray into Middle East conflicts. Um, the cost in terms of both human and financial implications for this country for the average American voter has been too high. And, I, you know, the president has demonstrated very little willingness to give on this. I mean, he's been willing to sacrifice uh, or he's been willing to see the departure of one of his most effective and respected uh, cabinet members over this very policy. So there's a lot of pushback, but it's quite clear we are leaving. Mm -hmm. um, we are trying to do so in the most responsible way possible, but um, fundamentally, this will, this will not be an arena where the United States can control the outcome. That was never going to be the case, but obviously by having troops on the ground, by engaging very directly with the Kurds, the, the Turks, um, other players, we, we had at least a stake in, in, in helping to shape that outcome. And I, you know, at this stage, I think that's no longer the case. I wanted to actually tie this to the, the points that Bahman and, and Ali both made about export of the revolution. Um, and about the, the Saudi-Israeli relationship today, because I think it is um, a, a very different context. Um, yeah. You know, if you think 20 years back when uh, there was at least a more viable prospect for internal evolution within Iran, 
Um, when you talk to Iranians um, and it, when you watch what, they, what the government did, there was a perception on the part of those who were trying to bring Iran into the world that the path to Iran's return, rehabilitation lay actually in the region, lay through regional diplomacy, through some kind of rapprochement with Saudi Arabia. Um, and that actually did take place. It was one of the first efforts that began after the, sure. the war. Um, it took quite a long time. It, it was stronger on economic and oil management than it was really in terms of political rehabilitation. But um, the the uh, the you know sort of Islamic World Summit that was held during the Khwarezmi period, um, when Crown Prince Abdullah actually came to Tehran, there was there was at least a sort of expectation that that would in fact help with broader rapprochement. I think what has happened in the interim, um, largely not precipitated by the Iranians, but certainly responded to by the Iranians, the, the U.S. intervention in Iraq, the subsequent sort of vacuum that the Iranians have filled very effectively, the Arab Spring and the opportunities that's afforded the, the Iranians, um, that changes the political context for them. And so now when you talk to Iranians, um, there is this very strong conviction that, you know, the Saudis have been up to um, sowing extremism and instability, and we, in fact, are trying to stabilize the region. We, we can't go through Riyadh in terms of a rapprochement with Washington. I think um, that may or may not be realistic, but that, that viewpoint, that perspective from Iran has changed fairly dramatically um, as a result, as has, I think, the viewpoint from Riyadh and elsewhere. Fair enough. Mahdi, you wanted to add something yes, to that? Yes. Um, don't forget that Iran's uh, regional policy serves Iran's internal policy, which means that Iran's involvement in the region would help uh, strengthening the position of hardliners in, inside the country. So they need to get involved in such activities. And without that, they lose power inside. So that's why I think... Um, um, simultaneously, uh, when it comes to the succession, mm -hmm. they, you know, the hardcore of the system or revolutionary guard, they might feel that they need to make some sort of external crisis in order to securitize the situation inside Iran. So the succession of the leadership may, uh, um, at the same time, may uh, uh, force them to do something crazy in the region. So uh, it would help them a lot to control all kind of, you know, um, cha um, chaotic development inside the country. So, I mean, it seems like pretty much the entire panel here is in agreement that the expansionist <clears throat> policies then of the regime is pretty existential to its survival. So then following up from that, what kind of dialogue then is possible with you know, with the Iranian leadership if this for them is a red line and at the same time is a primary concern of the West um, in terms of Iran's, you know, Iran's involvement in numerous other uh, conflicts in the region. So where, if there is to be then a dialogue, where, where is the dialogue? Where, where can it exist? Well, I think we should also uh, be clear here that Iran's relations with the Gulf countries differs with the country is bilateral. Sure. Iranians have had fairly good relations with Qataris. When the blockade happened on Qatar, Iran and Turkey jumped in. Mm -hmm. They have a good relationship with Sheikh Mohammed of Dubai, as far as I know. Uh, Emirates Airlines is the one, one of the preferred airlines by Iranians from US and around the world that flies to Iran back and forth. And the large number of Iranians living in the UA, in that part of the UA, I would believe they have had a positive business rela uh, relationship, therefore, that they have a good relationship with Oman, the country of Oman. The, I believe Oman was one of the countries that mediated the GCPOA mm -hmm. negotiations behind that. They have seemed to be having a good relationship with Iraq and the Iraqi government. So it is really, we are talking about Iran and Saudi Arabia. When we're talking about Iran and Gulf, That's we're talking fair. about two countries. We're talking about Saudi Arabia sure. and Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. the UAE. And if we look at the dynamics of this tree, the triangle here, Iranians feel that with Qataris, Sheikh Mohammed, Iraqis, and so forth, in terms of their mentality, they actually have the upper hand when it comes to this negotiation. They also have tried to uh, uh, bring uh, divisions within GCC. And they have effectively have done that continuously by focusing. So the regional problems 
first, besides Iran, there are certain problems in that region that predated Iran and the revolution and continue to do that. The issues of Qataris and Saudi Arabia has nothing to do with Iran. Sure. The issues of the UAE and Saudi have nothing to do with Iran. What Iranians are doing are taking advantage of those differences a little bit. And as long as the Saudi, MBS, and uh, UAE do not engage with Iran in a way of looking at Iran as somehow in the regional actor model and saying, OK, can, can they come up with an agreement with Iran that is regional? And can they kind of, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia I'm talking about, on the issues of oil, on issues of OPEC, there are so many different issues between them right now, US relations. And dialogue has to start someplace. But unfortunately, every time they want to start a dialogue, we go back to that sabotage again. So Iranians were in dialogue with Saudi Arabia. Somebody attacked the Saudi embassy in Tehran. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they need to kind of um, uh, get hold of these issues that if they want to have dialogue, they got to get, get control of these things. And you cannot attack the embassy of a country and then negotiate with it. So you get, we have to see this from both sides, I think. We have to see this from the regional perspective of the right countries on. in that region. We also have to see this as... Ali mentioned with Israel and United States. And then you see the Iranian ruling elite has a very complicated things in their hands. <laughs> because uh, I always used to tell my students that Iran is one of the few countries that has borders with 16 countries. Just the foreign ministry's regional office itself is a drastic office. 16 countries they border with. And uh, it, in many ways, the regime in Iran has not been capable of handling diplomacy internationally and regionally. And in many ways, I think um, they're, they're dealing with the seriousness of this issue that uh, what, what is the appropriate regional model? And uh, uh, many people think that model should come from Tehran. Some people think it should be coming from Saudi Arabia. Some people think, no, it should come from the Yemeni conflict if they come together. There are so many competing models right now. And uh, I just don't see that happening right now. All right, I will open it up for questions right now. I see we've got quite a few. Um, if you, I will call on you, and if you could please just identify yourself and your um, affiliation. Uh, sorry, I can't see. Well, where's our microphone? Oh, right there. OK, uh, to this woman over there, please. Hi. Hello, I'm Mimi Burke from Brownstein Hyatt. Uh, Suzanne mentioned uh, a little bit about this uh, America first uh, phenomenon here with the Trump administration. And I also see that there is a little bit of that going on in Iran, as we mentioned, that there might be an Iran first grassroots movement. Um, we talked a little bit about how that might affect uh, Iran's policy in Syria, but how would that affect Iran's policy in Yemen? You know, Yemen is a, is a very, uh, for the Iranians, is a very low cost and high yield uh, policy. Um, they basically invest what a colleague of mine describes as a pittance um, in order to sustain this, uh, this Houthi movement um, and to provide some technology and some uh, logistics. Uh, and they get huge rewards in the sense that they have managed to bog the, the Saudi government down in a war that is not only strategically disastrous, not only economically draining, but has become, rightfully so, a, a genuine public relations crisis in key European capitals and in this town. Um, and so for the Iranians, uh, I think, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving. They will fight to, to the last Houthi. Um, the other piece of this conflict that's important is the extent to which they have relied upon uh, the relationship that was established by Hezbollah in Yemen. This is not a sort of um, direct, in many cases, Iranian investment. Um, but the fact that they have ceded uh, the, the support for militias um, to at least one uh, fairly autonomous proxy group that now can carry out its own uh, engagements. It was the, the it was Hezbollah that was first engaged with training the Houthis, um, and that remains one of the the primary actors on the ground there, as well as of course in Syria and elsewhere. Um, and so it, it it becomes a sort of complicated relationship management question for Tehran. 
Um, I think it's one that they would happily um, be willing to negotiate around because, in effect, uh, if they can get something better than simply uh, bogging down the Saudis in terms of rehabilitation or sanctions relief or something else, I don't know that the I don't think there's any reason to believe that they're invested in creating an Islamic Republic in Yemen. Um, but in effect, uh, as long as that opportunity remains on offer, uh, as long as the Saudis continue to pursue uh, a total military victory where one has eluded them now for years, um, I think the Iranians will continue to remain in this position of, of uh, yielding a, a pretty nice benefit for very little investment. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, should okay. we take one more question okay. and then we'll take you first? Uh, this gentleman over here. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, when Khamenei uh, was elevated, he uh, had quite a bit lower clerical ranking and got a couple notches to qualify for the uh, for the uh, Veliati Faki. And uh, I don't think Iran's going to do that again. So I'm wondering if any of you are willing to guess who the successors might be from the true full-scale Ayatollahs. And second, um, I imagine in the event of a complete conflagration that at some point the uh, much larger and much more deprived Artesh might side with the people, and the, particularly the young people, against the IRGC. Uh, am I crazy or is that a possibility? Yes, um, Ayatollah Khamenei uh, could, be <clears throat> could become Ayatollah in a matter of half a day because there was not Twitter yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's not possible anymore. Right. So at uh, this time, I think uh, those who have power, I mean, institutions that we talked about, uh, including uh, Revolutionary Guard, they don't like to see any young Ayatollah to replace Khamenei, who, um, it, in spite of his weakness, who would have enough time to consolidate his power. As you said, Khamenei was weak, but he was 50 years old when he became the supreme leader. In March, he's going to be 80. So uh, he had enough time to sideline his uh, opponents and become a powerful uh, supreme leader. This time, I think they prefer those who are involved in the succession process. They are, um, they prefer an old, ailing, respected Ayatollah who's going to die in a few years, <laughs> but just to maintain the office and provide the legitimacy and does not have enough energy and time to establish his own empire. So uh, this is first. Second, when we talk about At Artish or the army, uh, it has gone through a substantial transformation. 40 years ago, Artish was basically the organization which was created by Shah. And the, everything in Art, uh, Artish was different. Now, the commanders, the high-ranking commanders of Artish are those who joined Artish after revolution. So uh, there is no substantial ideological difference between Artesh and Revolutionary Guard. Actually, Artesh could be uh, it's some sort of shadow, uh, uh, like uh, it's like a shadow of the Revolutionary Guard. They have limited uh, agenda, they have limited budget, they have a, a different organization, but ideologically there is no difference between uh, what you hear from the commanders of uh, Artesh and commanders of Revolutionary Guard. Ali, I know you wanted to add, so quick, because I want to get to as many questions. Uh, as really quick. Uh, quick. Uh, so first of all, what we see is a process where former officers of the Revolutionary Guards are promoted to chief commanders in the regular military. You never see regular military officers being promoted to positions in the Revolutionary Guards. That is really important. Secondly, uh, and just as important, the IR, IRGC bases are usually in city centers because their job is to suppress popular uprisings. Regular military bases and garrisons are outside of big cities, you know, and, and, and there is a very far geographic distance between the base 
and the city centers, exactly because their uh, mission, according to, con to the Constitution, is to safeguard the territorial integrity of Iran, to protect the borders, not to take care of domestic uh, unrest situations. And all the uh, political control mechanisms, subjective control mechanism that Saddam Hussein, the Soviets, you know, everybody else has been using in order to coop-proof their systems, the Islamic Republic had perfected them. I have been studying it, and I see very, very small uh, chance or risk, however you look at it, of a military coup instigated by the regular military. I simply do not see it coming. None of you are willing to name a successor? Yeah. No, I want names. Well, I think if you, if you look at the patterns that have come, the, you have to have two qualifications besides all age and everything that he's mentioned. There is a word called etemat. There is a trust that these clerics have among each other. And they have to have somebody who's gone through the process, preferably judiciary, because judiciary is very important in terms of uh, implementation of the Islamic punishments and loyalty to the system. So the head of the judiciary, uh, Ayatollah Larijani, was just giving a promotion. He was giving the head of the expediency council. And so that could be a sign that he is being a kind of a groomed for something like that. There is also uh, the former candidate of president, Raisi, who ran against uh, Rouhani. He controls a huge, powerful endowment in Mashhad. He's very uh, supportive. They've been talking about him as replacing the judiciary and so forth like that. So in terms of their own sh small circles of people that they're talking about, they're talking about trusted clerics who have gone through this experience first, meaning uh, people like judiciary people, council of guardian people, if there comes to anything, that's, that's all that we made could disagree, but they're not going to go to a city of Qom and try to do a uh, job interview in Qom. <laughs> they are simply have a very limited list of people they can trust, and it all going to come down to the question of whether those people say yes or no. I mean, uh, I told Larijani, his brother is the head of the parliament. If he becomes supreme leader, then what do we have here? To come, I would say, a conflict of interest. <laughs> so there are all these issues that could uh, stop him. But uh, if there's anybody who's going to go through this process, has to have absolute trust of these organs that we've been talking about, and must have a demonstrated absolute trust. Merci. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Let's go to. Anyone have any questions here? If we go over there, please. Yeah. Uh, chief economist at the IAF. Uh, the conclusion I had from the discussion is that it's unlikely to have a major change in the regime, and particularly on Iran's intervention in other Arab countries. Uh, what needs to be done? I'm thinking of three uh, factors. One, uh, economic collapse along the lines what what happened in Venezuela. And that needs to be that the uh, Europeans should be on board with harsher sanctions along with the United States. Uh, second, a war in the region. Israel and Iran may be supported by United States. And third, uh, what if Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, they sit with the Iranians and s resolve their problems and uh, uh, have a more friendly relationship. Could this one of these factors have a change in the attitude of the Iranian regime? Who'd like to take that one? Anyone here? Ali? It, it, you, you have very good points. Uh, right now, as, as, as I see it, uh, unfortunately, the United States has, has brought itself in a situation where it wants to disentangle itself from the Middle East militarily, a vacuum is created, and everybody sh is trying to fill that vacuum. Uh, it will take some years before all parties find out that they are wasting blood and treasure for the sake of nothing. France and Germany went through that process. France and Britain, even before that, went through a similar process. So unfortunately, I, I, I believe that sometime uh, you cannot, and there is not a ready-made solution for conflicts. 
people need to make mistakes. They need to make sacrifices and find out the futility of their sacrifices because no one is going to lose. Iran is not going to lose in the short term. The Saudis and the Emiratis and the Israelis are not going to lose in the short term. They have to find out the solution, but it takes the wisdom of experience. Once they have committed all possible mistakes, hopefully, hopefully they will reach the conclusion that there is need to be conversations and talks. That is one. And second, uh, and I know that I'm perhaps too optimistic in, in, in this regard, but maybe, maybe the fact that we have one faction prevailing in the succession struggle actually helps bring about the kind of dialogue we would like to see between Iran and its uh, neighbors and other regional powers. If there no longer is a rivaling faction trying to sabotage the talks and the dialogue, maybe it's not such a bad thing. But of course, the question is if the ideological foundations of the revolution of the gods and the need to have a constant permanent crisis in Iran's foreign relations allows that one institution actually to use its monopoly over power to reach a serious agreement with its neighbors. Thank you, Ali. Do we have any more questions? That gentleman here. Thank right you. I am Amir. I am from Iran. I am researcher fellow at Georgetown University. I have a lot of questions, unfortunately. OK, well, let's, uh, let, there's a few yeah, other yes, people who want to ask questions, point, yeah. so let's keep it brief. Uh, Ali mentioned about the Qasem Soleimani and Rouhani and said that, for example, who should talk with the US? But I don't understand what's wrong here. Because, for example, we are, we have to deal with US, with Trump, how we can trust to Trump. And you know that uh, Trump, for example, saying that this country want to help to Iran and impose tough sanctions on Iran. You know, it is the politics. And we can say a lot of things like, the, like this. You know, the main question is that, I think that, what should we do in Middle East? For example, I think that all this discussion, something is uncanny. You know, for example, you said that, for example, America um, want to help us, and we are trying to struggle with Saudi Arabia in Middle East. And for example, Iran have a lot of problem, all this issue is right. But what should we do? Okay. Uh, what is our options? And uh, I have a, another question. OK, from sorry, sir. I think we've question, got <laughs> quite a question. few questions here. After, uh, with Susan, um, if Iran can handle tough sanction, and Iran if can manage this tough sanction, what's your next plan? Is it war or the other issue? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. We'll take the first question. Um, Bahman, do you want to take uh, that one? So I guess by pronoun we, you mean Iranians or Americans? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, uh, uh, I, I think, again, I go back to my question of uh, society to society, societal relations. I've, I've been involved in a lot of export diplomacy, relationship, people to people with the United States. I think. One of the tragic mistakes we make in this country is that we don't emphasize enough people-to-people -people relationship. Today, the sanctions on medicine, the sanctions on humanitarian relationship, any organization that has the name Iran in it, their wires get flagged. So we have a problem here that Iranian people, the travel ban, there are policies here that regardless of who is in power in Tehran will, impart, will, will hurt the Iranian people. And Iranian people would get a negative image of America. And we need to kind of be careful about that. I think uh, President Trump talks very glowingly about the Iranian people and how wonderful it is that the United States wants to do something for Iranian people. But at the same time, uh, anybody who's uh, trying to send some medicine to Iran gets caught up into that whole triangle of banking laws and all that. So I think. We, the United States should differentiate its policies more, not to allow humanitarian relationship, medicine, all these things to happen. That, that is a critical thing. And I think um, another important question is the role of the Iranian Americans in this country. There are a million Iranian Americans in this country. They have not gotten civically engaged like uh, uh, American Jews are vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Iranian Americans have a responsibility in this country 
they have a responsibility to think about their country, their home, whatever is in their heart, language, culture. And they need to kind of become more civically active in influencing policy because people in Congress do not listen to you, me, and this panel. They listen to their voters. And you have a million voters in California, Iranians in California. You have 25,000 minimum Iranians in Utah that I live in. You have a huge number of Iranians in this area. And they have not been that engaged in terms of uh, having a civic role for the questions you ask. If the question of war, they should come up. They should write to their congressman. They should write to the senator and say, we oppose that. So unless all those sentences come together, I think uh, we, United States policy toward Iran will go toward this up and down, up and down, because uh, we, we don't make enough differentiations in these areas that I mentioned right now. Suzanne, do you want to take the second part of that question on plan B for the US? Sure, and it's obviously not my plan because I'm not uh, serving this administration and I've been a critic of a number of the steps that the administration has taken to date. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see this administration as precipitating or provoking a war with Iran. Um, as I said, the president campaigned on and, and is committed to um, extricating the United States from military conflicts in the Middle East. He seems to be vehemently opposed to starting another one. Um, at least some of the reporting, press reporting on uh, his selection of John Bolton suggests that he, in fact, made that a condition uh, of uh, John Bolton's uh, uh, return to the White House in the role of national security advisor, uh, that there wouldn't be a war with Iran. Um, and, and that's why I think, you know, the application of pressure is, to some extent, the consensus point among those with different ambitions within the administration, but it's also um, a, a natural resting point for U.S. policy, that everyone is satisfied with the application of very tough pressure. Our regional allies are quite satisfied with that. There is no real clear understanding of what, in fact, would be a, a reasonable bargain. I don't get any sense from those in the State Department that there is an active effort to try to chart a path toward a serious negotiating process. Um, and so, in fact, pressure for the sake of pressure um, is, is a satisfactory plan B for now, and it will probably sustain itself. What's the breaking point? Does Iran walk away from the JCPOA? I tend to think not. They very little incentive for them to do so. Um, the crisis could come if and as the Iranians respond in other arenas. And in particular, my major concern is that uh, as the sanctions are applied over time, um, the one opportunity that Iran, that if I were sitting in Tehran, I would see is uh, anything that drives up oil prices because it helps their bottom line for whatever they can, in fact, export and whatever revenues they can, in fact, repatriate. Um, and it hurts the president in terms of here in the United States in terms of his political capital to continue to apply maximum pressure to Iran. Um, where that, you know, how they would attempt to try to create a supply disruption, I, I, I wouldn't speculate. But, you know, it's an, it, would, it would be a natural temptation at some stage uh, as a policy that helps Iran and hurts the United States in a way uh, that, that doesn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily be intended to pre precipitate a war, but could certainly uh, have that end state. Uh, Ali, you wanted to add to that? I think we have a few more questions to get through here. Uh, you were, the, the good gentleman was asking specifically what we should do, and, and I interpreted uh, we as, as Iranians. Yeah. What should Iran do? Well, let, me, let me share some of my thoughts with you. Uh, the Islamic Republic uh, has at times shown great degree of uh, flexibility when it comes to its foreign relations. Uh, Iran-Contra clearly shows that Iran and Israel can have common interests. They can cooperate, and they can cooperate uh, even with the U.S. So my question is this. Why do we Iranians in the Islamic Republic need to be more Palestinian than the Palestinians? How come Palestinians can engage in talks and negotiations, even dream of peaceful coexistence co with their Jewish neighbors in the state of Israel, but we Iranians, we are more Palestinians than they are, and we do not recognize the state of Israel. Why? We who have purchased Israeli and American arms in the 1980s because we had a common enemy. We should have the honesty and decency to do it in public, and not only secretly get El Al to fly American spare parts. 
for our F-14 fighters. That honesty is what I'm calling for. I'm also calling for a similar honesty, but also courage. If the French and Germans, after all those horrible wars, can be neighbors, can be allies in NATO and in the European Union, why not Iran and Saudi Arabia? You tell me that France and Germany, they went through two horrible uh, world wars. Believe me, we Middle Easterners, why should we commit the same mistakes as the Europeans? It is no sign of modernity to kill each other like that. There is no need for us to engage in two world wars between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We can do better than the Europeans, and this is what I'm calling for. Ali, very animated there. Um, oh, I think um, we've maybe got uh, time for one more question, the, yeah. if we've got them. Oh, we've yeah, got, sorry, yeah. I haven't seen you over there. Dan Liebman, uh, yeah, well, the principal reason given for the U.S. Uh, being in Syria is to subdue Daesh, but isn't there a subsidiary reason, in other words, to help the opposition gain as much territory as possible and prevent the Assad regime from extending their influence, and in line with that, doesn't the U.S. withdrawal from Syria actually weaken Iranian influence because the Syrian regime needs less dependence now on, on Iranian power in order to combat the opposition? Who would like to take that one? Suzanne, do you want to take that? I'll, I'll just say the U.S. policy here. So <laughs> I would just say it. quickly. I, I, unfortunately, I think that's wishful thinking. Yeah. I, I don't think that even uh, full control of Syrian territory would make the Assad regime less dependent upon um, economic, military, uh, and reconstruction aid from Iran. Thank you. All right. Well. Thank you, everyone, for this. This was a really great um, and invigorating panel discussion on Iran. Um, thanks to our panelists, and thanks to...